what is Zig? If I haven't heard of Zig before, what what is Zig and what's it doing? Zig is a systems programming language. Um, well, we do say it's a general purpose programming language, and it really is. Like you can program anything with it. What, what's the origin story of Zig? How did it how did it get started? Andrew Kelly is the creator of uh, the Zig programming language, and he wanted to write a digital audio workstation. So. I think he started with a higher level programming language, figured out pretty soon that garbage collection doesn't play well with real time stuff. Um, and more in general, higher level programming languages, they kind of do the opposite. They don't give you access to the full capabilities of the machine. They, they uh, describe a space in which you're supposed to operate in and you're kind of not allowed to get out of that space. So then he went into lower level programming languages. So C and C++. Uh, but those have also their own sets of issues. Um, C, for example, is famous for having issues with metaprogramming, and C++ has a certain take on, like, it likes its own complexity. So uh, he didn't feel comfortable using either, and so he ended up making his own language. You know, C is an old language, but it's also everywhere. Um, I guess, what are some problems that, that Zig aims to fix there? Hey folks, this is Alex. Today's episode is about Zig. Zig is, is in the news lately for a lot of things. You know, Bun, the new JavaScript runtime, is written in Zig. I spoke with Yoron from Tiger Beetle, who they're writing all their stuff in Zig. It's it's part of this new wave of lower level systems programming languages, right? Like Go and Rust, and now Zig, that are that are trying to improve on languages of the past. So Zig aims to be a better C. I thought this was a really interesting episode. I have Loris Crow here. He's the VP of community at the Zig Software Foundation. He walks me through, you know, why Zig? How is it sort of improving on C, where it's being used? As well as just his rise to VP of community, which I thought was a really interesting story on, on how he got there and just, you know, following your passion and, and sharing what you're learning and, and things like that. So uh, I hope you enjoy this episode. If you have any questions, comments, guests that you want, anything like that, feel free to reach out to me or to Sean Faulkner. And with that, let's get to the episode. Loris, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me, Alex. Yeah, so I'm excited to talk to you. You are VP of community at the Zig Software Foundation. I've been hearing more about Zig. You know, we had Yoron from Tiger Beetle on. They're all written in Zig. So a lot of interesting stuff going on there. Um, for those that don't know much about you, can you just give a little bit of, of your background and, and what you do at Zig? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I'm a software engineer. I studied computer science, specialized in bioinformatics, never done much in bioinformatics, uh, and at some point point, I went into the developer advocacy, which somehow led me to the Zig Software Foundation. So uh, now I'm VP of community and my main job is to basically, I guess the actual job description is increase the total amount of effort being spent on Zig. And that's a variety of things, helping people do more with Zig, getting money for the Software Foundation, do communication work, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you must be doing a good job because everyone I talk to about Zig just talks about like how welcoming the community is. I think that's, you know, part Andrew, but I think you've done a, a great job around that as well. So I excited to hear a little bit more about your path and about the ZSF um, generally. But I guess maybe just give us an overview of like, what, what is Zig? If I haven't heard of Zig before, what, what is Zig and what's it doing? Yeah. So Zig is a systems programming language. Um, well, we do say it's a general purpose programming language, and it really is. Like, you can program anything with it. Like, uh, people sometimes see general purpose and they think, oh, it's like just marketing boilerplate. No, no, we actually mean it. The idea is, like, you have a computer, you can use Zig. You have a tiny embedded device, you can use Zig. You have a GPU, you can use Zig. Well, with some caveats, but some stuff is still work in progress. But that's kind of the idea. Um, but it is a low level programming language. So you do manual memory management, you have full control over what the hardware is giving you. That's kind of the idea. The idea is that, that what the machine is capable of doing, you should be able to make it do by programming it in Zig. Um, so yeah, that's, I would say the, the main point of Zig. Yep, absolutely. And I, I love, as I was like doing research on it, just some of the, I don't know, claims or different things like that. But, you know, you hear Zig C being called like a better C or, or, you know, Andrew called it C, but with the problems fixed or or even saying Zig is like intended to replace C. But I think like those are ambitious goals and and really cool um, to see. I guess like what what's the origin story of Zig? How did it how did it get started? Uh, so the origin story is that um, Andrew wanted to write. So Andrew is the creator. Andrew Kelly is the creator of uh, the Zig programming language. And he, before that, he wanted to write a digital audio workstation. And, uh, the problem with audio is that it need, it's real time stuff. Uh, you need to be fast and you need to be there on time. Otherwise you, you hear audio skipping. 
So I think he started with a higher level programming language, figured out pretty soon that garbage collection doesn't play well with real time stuff. Um, and more in general, higher level programming languages, they kind of do the opposite. They don't give you access to the full capabilities of the machine. They, ha they uh, describe a space in which you're supposed to operate in, and you're kind of not allowed to get out of that space. And, and for higher level, you're talking like JavaScript, Python, like that? Exactly, JavaScript, Python, that kind of stuff. I think he started with Go. I'm not 100% sure, but he also, I think, did, did try Go at some point. So then he went into lower level programming languages, so C and C++. Uh, but those have also their own sets of issues. Um, C, for example, is famous for having issues with metaprogramming and C++ has a certain take on like it likes its own complexity. So uh, he didn't feel comfortable using either. And so he ended up making his own language. And fast forward, that's where we are today. Yeah. And this did a digital audio workstation, was this like a side project he was working on? Was this his full-time job? What, what was going on there? No, I think it was supposed to be a side project. Uh, and I think he never really went super far with it. Like, it's not a project that you can find on his repo and try it out. But I do think he plans to go back uh, working on it um, once Zig is done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, those are some serious life goals to, like, have a side project so good that I need to create a new programming <laughs> yeah. language to replace C. You know, <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. Okay, so tell me maybe about... Maybe let's start with the problems of C. You mentioned a little bit around metaprogramming, but like, where are what are what are some you know C is an old language, but it's also everywhere. Um, I guess what are some problems that that Zig aims to fix there? Oof. Okay, there's there's a few. I won't give you the the full list. Oh, let me, let me think of like a few highlights. And and first of all, j just your background. So you said like dev advocacy at Redis and and things like that. Were you a low level systems programmer like C and C plus plus? Were you doing higher level stuff? What's your background? So, no, I was never a low-level programmer before doing Zig. The reason why I learned about Zig in the first place is because while I was at Redis Labs, um, at some point, I needed to find a low-level programming language to develop modules for, Z uh, for Redis. So the idea is that Redis is this data structure server, and you can implement your own custom data structures. But that requires, it, it's like it's a plugin system, like you can find plenty uh, out there. Um, yeah, and I needed a low-level programming language, and I first tried uh, that with C, pulled it off, but the, the experience wasn't great. And so since I needed to do communication, I needed to explain to other people how to do this, I was trying to find something that would be l less problematic than C, and that's how I found Zig. Yeah, wow, very cool. Okay, so anyway, I, I, I diverted us there. What are some problems with C? I, I think there are like two big ones. Uh, I, you know what, let's do three. Okay, so... First big one, metaprogramming. That one is easy. C macros are famous for being a, uh, I don't know, a Pandora's box of uh, potential issues that come from, from macros. Um, they are confusing. They produce weird unintended side effects. They're also very limited because people, like, if you try to use macros to do something like generics, it's not great. It's like search and replace in your text files doesn't work good. Okay. And and just just for clarity, macros, these are like... I mean, it's like code that alters your code, right? Is that right? Like generate some other stuff? Exactly. But the problem is that it's code that alters your code uh, in a textual manner. So it doesn't understand text structure. It only understands text replacement. So like, you know how uh, SQL queries used to have this problem of query injection where people, since you concatenate things together, right? People, if you don't think about it adversarially, people could... Uh, put into your query stuff that you didn't expect them to be able to. Um, now, with macros, it's not exactly as adversarial, but sometimes uh, people use your macro as a function, and there are surprising side effects when the macro is not well engineered. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, and that macro just because I expile, it, it sort of expanded or operated on like at compile time, basically, is that what's going on? Exactly. Yeah, they have a pre-processing step. So you you take a C file that has macros in it, give it to the compiler. The compiler produces a C file that where the macros have been resolved, basically in the final text. Okay. 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 So so issue number one is is sort of metaprogramming specifically around macros. And that that the problem with that is that it comes like um, that's expressivity, expressivity. Like you you want to be to express something in language in C, you're very limited. So you start trying to use macros. Macros give you superpowers, but man, do they come at a cost. So in Zig, we don't have any kind of metaprogramming that 
allows you to, to manipulate the source code as text. We don't have macros. What we do have is com time. And com time is the idea that you write normal Z code and that code uh, executes a, comp a compile time. And while you are at compile time, you can also pass around types that you normal that you are not able to pass around at runtime. So at compile time, you can also pass around as values also types. So for example, generics in Zig is not like a special syntax with the diamond brackets. What like, you know what people are used to from C uh, Java, I don't know TypeScript, right? Diamond brackets. TypeScript. Yeah. yeah, diamond brackets everywhere. Specify types using like a its own tiny dialect, its own tiny sub language. In Zig, a generic type is a function that takes in a type and outputs a new type. So an array list, or uh, yeah, an array list is uh, of uh, type T is a function that takes T as input and returns a new type. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. And and so comp time, yeah, that was something that, that kept coming up. Is this mostly like a uh, a p performance improvement? Is it more just like a complexity improvement for me, the developer, as I'm sort of writing out my code? This is this is less complex. Like, what what is comp time giving me as a developer? Um, comp time gives you, I think, uh, it gives you not just performance. Uh, performance certainly is part of it because obviously, when something can be done once at compile time instead of being done multiple times at runtime, that's a performance improvement. That's good. You want it. Um, it, but it also helps with, for example, uh, expressing certain constraints. So types and generics. What's good about generics is that, uh, like in other languages, so I'm, I'm thinking about it more broadly, but generics uh, allows you, for example, to specify type constraints, right? You, you say, oh, yes, this thing accepts a thing that has, I don't know, can be of multiple types, but these types, they need to be able to do that thing. They can be added together, for example, or something like this. Uh, with comp time, you can express uh, constraints that I think are either impossible or extremely hard to express with the diamond bracket syntax. Let me give you just one example, which, by the way, uh, relates also back to Redis. Uh, I was writing a Redis client, and I wanted my client to be able to recognize uh, certain commands. And Redis commands are, um, it's, it, think of them as like text queries. So you, you send like get, set, and these are like just text that you're sending over. And they are case insensitive. So lowercase, get, uppercase, get, it's the same command. Um, so I needed a case insensitive equals function in my client because I wanted to recognize these commands when the user was providing them as a string. Now, um, it turns out that um, and I had to do this case insensitive uh, equality check. But it turns out that since I'm hard coding one of the two operands in my code, like I'm checking if the user provided command is get. So th that get string literal is hard coded in my program and I'm providing it. And it turns out that if you uh, make sure to type that one in uppercase, then you can simplify the uh, comparison logic just a little bit. Like you can remove one branch. Um, now the problem is that only works if the provided string literal is uppercase, right? If somebody provides a lowercase, uh, string literal or like a G uppercase G lowercase E uppercase T or something weird, then it doesn't work anymore. Now here's the idea. Um, how can you say in a, in diamond brackets, uh, yeah, this first argument needs to be, um, as an uppercase string, it's hard. I'm sure there can be weird ways of pulling it off, but it's complicated. In Zig, here's what you do. You take the string, you do a for loop character by character, and you check that it's uppercase. It's between uppercase A and uppercase Z. And if it's not, then there's a built-in called compile error, and you output a compile error where you say, this function expects the first argument to be all uppercase. But it was not. Yep. Wow. Okay. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, I can see how that would be powerful. Like in a lot of a lot of ways. like yeah, just simplifying some of that stuff down. Yeah. Okay. So every time people call that function, the rock custom logic runs and they get a good compile error. So you can imagine that you can do this with anything, any kind of arbitrary logic because you can use normal zig code uh, for anything that is compile time known. Yep. Okay. Okay. That's that's very interesting. Okay. So that's that's one sort of problem with. With C that you're talking about that that Zig works on, what are the other two that you were that you were thinking of? Yeah, so uh, yeah, one is metaprogramming. Another one, a huge one, is 
uh, building and cross-compilation. Building C projects and C++ projects is a nightmare. I think there's a lot of developers out there, including me uh, in the past, where that you give them a C project, like you, they look at the C project and they have no idea how to build it. Um, and it's not their fault because, I mean, some C projects are easy to build. So to be fair, some, not all, not all C, C projects, but some, actually the majority, in my opinion, are a nightmare to build because the build systems have their own um, uh, implicit things that you're supposed to just know. Right. And those are platform dependent. So you come from Windows, you have no idea how to build something for Linux because the, the idioms and customs are completely different. And then the, and also the tools are different because like make works on Linux, but it doesn't work on Windows. So for Windows, somebody has to provide the batch file. Uh, oh, but then can I build this in PowerShell? So yeah, just put in also a PS1 file. And then somebody else doesn't like make it. They want CMake. And there's like, um, there's this soup of build files and build systems and it's a mess. Yeah. Interesting. And so how does, how does Zig fix this? They have like sort of one, one way to build, uh, one builder, one compiler for them all. Yeah. Zig has its own build system. They can build Zig projects and C projects and C++ projects. It, like it's a, it's a very general purpose build system. That, that part is amazing to me. So like if I have just a, you know, a C project that's been lying around forever, I could just pull in Zig and, and build that and without having the make or, or, um, you know, bat files or anything like that. Yeah, you can get rid of all those dependencies, but it's not the, the, the idea is that it's not just because of the build system. Ziggy is also doing other things that build systems usually don't do to be able to support that use case. Such as? Uh, such as providing, uh, uh, so making sure to set up everything correctly in the build pipeline um, because it's a compiler as well, so it knows how to build everything. But more importantly, it has its own... Um, C libraries for all different targets. So not only it's more reliable and fewer dependencies, but you can also, it allows you to do, for example, okay, I'm on Linux, but please build this program for Windows. And you get a Windows executable that works and vice versa. That's another thing that usually C projects don't do. Like sometimes C projects, well, oftentimes they can be built on multiple, on different platforms, but they are usually, okay, you build for the platform that you're on. And that can be Mac, that can be Linux, but you can't do from Linux to Mac. Well, for Zig, that's a core use case. Okay, and how does sort of, I guess, the time of compilation compare for if I'm using Zig versus if I'm using, you know, Make with my C project? Are, are those similar? Like, what, what does that sort of look like? Uh, yeah, those are pretty much the same because uh, the Zig build system isn't... Mm, isn't particularly heavy and uh, they both have caching. So with make, you also get caching, uh, but you also get that from, from the Zigbee system. Actually, to be precise, it's not just the Zigbee system. You get caching from Zig also if you just use it as a C compiler. So th there's the Zig CC sub command. That one does caching. Like if you just use vanilla Clang and you try to, go to compile with vanilla Clang, that one does no caching at all ever. Yeah. And this is just like fascinating to me. Like why... Why was it a new project, a new language altogether that was able to build essentially a better compiler for C, if I'm understanding? Like, why didn't, why couldn't C do that themselves? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I have an answer that, uh, let's just say it's my opinion, because I don't have any hard evidence to present uh, to convince everybody, like, in, in a clear-cut way. But my, in my opinion, the problem is that there is a lot of things in software engineering that we look from the outside and think is like a solved problem or something that is too complicated for us to tackle or some, something we shouldn't touch. And so the, the, if we want to do something in that space, our usual approach is to build more abstractions on top. Uh, you could argue that make file, uh, sorry, that CMake is an example of that. Yeah, I might be misremembering, but I think that CMake outputs make files so it's like, it's a pile of abstractions. So um, the Zig philosophy instead, it starts from Andrew. Andrew's philosophy, which then became the Zig philosophy is, well, no, you don't just stop there. You peel the layers, you look what's underneath, and then if something needs to be changed, uh, then you do change it. And the reality is that, and this has been, um, and, and this is where I, I started underst really understanding this, 
is that um, there are a lot of things out there that we think are perfect that actually are really not. And even if you're not a super expert in that field, you can do serious improvement if you want to. You have to put in some effort, but like things are not perfect. I can give you an example of that if you want. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, I've been working recently on a static website generator. Part of my work, a lot of my work is um, dealing with content that ends up on websites. Uh, writing blog posts, um, Zig Showtime has its own website. I run this is the official Zig website. Uh, I also run a conference called Software You Can Love, and I have to make a website for my conference. Um, and so I use static generators a lot. And I started with um, a framework, uh, like a, a JavaScript framework, then switched to Hugo, which is the Go one, um, which I liked, but there are some things that I wanted to improve. So one day I beat the bullet and said, okay, you know what? I'm making my own static website generator. Um, and while I was doing that, I decided to also make my own um Templating language. So instead of using Mustache or Jinja or one of the usual ones, I said, you know what? No, I want to have my own take on this. Um, and as I was doing that, and I looked at Markdown parsers and this stuff, which are C libraries, which are the ones that everybody uses, like Three Seater, for example. Um, once you get to that level, you realize that it's not like they're bad. Absolutely not. Three Seater is great. But a lot of people, for example, use Three Seater has this thing which is very interesting. It's really good at rebuilding the tree incrementally from changes. So that's why people use three seater in editors. But but people use three seater also for situations where you're not building an editor. And so that ability to rebuild the the, the AST partially, it's completely wasted. But there are trade-offs that have been made to allow for that use case. So the, the perfect parser for a static website generator is probably not three seater. So I basically went down this path where I'm realizing that, yes, even parsers for very common data formats could probably use some better libraries for the use case that I'm, that I'm interested in. Yep. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, that's that's super cool. Okay, so how is your static site generator coming along? It's complete enough to be able to build my personal blog, and that's that's where it is for now. But I'm working on it. Yep, good thing. I, I love that idea, though. I think you're right, like, you know, it doesn't take, um, you know, a huge team or anything like that. I feel like an individual person that just like has a clear vision of like, hey, this is where this could be improved and a little bit of of uh, just energy and desire to go after that. I think is it's amazing, like how much better things can be. And, and you won't necessarily nail everything first try or like uh, really make something that is strictly superior than everything that was done before. Not, not really. But uh, even the very good solutions out there are not good for everything. And the problem is that what stops people really, in my opinion, well, when it comes to C and C++, I guess what stops them is also the build system, <laughs> those projects. <laughs> but w once you're able to peel that back, uh, uh, like to, to remove that, that, um, uh, that block here, uh, which Z helps you uh, remove, then it's really just a matter of not believing that this stuff is impossible for you to touch. Like as a high level uh, programmer for most of my past life, I know the feeling of, yeah, well, I'm a Python programmer. There is no way I'm ever going to be able to open this C dependency and make change its behavior. But instead you can, you can. Yeah. Yep. That's very true. I, I'm surprised even at the, the people, you know, who are JavaScript Python developers that maybe use a third party package in Python or JavaScript and like won't go source diving into that to like, you know, figure out something. Yeah. It's just like, why isn't this working? And won't go figure that out on GitHub. Like, I feel like that's how I learned to program was just like, that's how I learned to read code was reading through Django dot or like the actual source code and trying to figure out how it works, you know? Same, same. Yeah, th that was my same exact experience. Uh, I, in university, uh, my classes were doing Java, which I didn't really like. So I did everything in Python. And at the same time, I learned Django. And yeah, the Django code base also for me was the first code base. Like the Java standard library, the, the, no, not a great experience. But the Django code base, that one was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was a great mix of like really good documentation, uh, you know, a good Stack Overflow community, but also like this code base that you could actually like dig into and figure out what's going on and like how, how you do some of this stuff. It was, uh, yeah, it was super helpful for me. That's funny that that it worked for you as well. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so in terms of <clears throat> being a C and C++ compiler, was that part of the very early vision of Zig? Or is that something like down the road, she's like, oh, this has become such a hassle for us? Like, how did that sort of get pulled into Zig? Yeah, so uh, the idea is that Zig uh, started depending on LLVM, I think, since, on the, uh, since the beginning. And the, for people who don't know what LLVM does precisely, the idea is that when you want to make a compiler and you want your compiler to work on multiple platforms, and multiple platforms means different CPUs, so ARM versus x86-64, for example, and also multiple OSs, then you need to write um, code. Well, you need to be able to, to output the correct instructions for the specific uh, OS plus CPU combo. Um, and that's a lot of work. So a while ago, some people started this project called LVM, where basically they are making one, um, let's call it a compiler backend, one compiler backend, let's say to rule them all. Basically, they take care of the uh, instruction selection and optimization passes, and you just output something called LVM bitcode, which is like an intermediate representation that their backend understands, uh, but you then do the, the work once. So you kind of target LVM, and then LVM is able to output for specific platforms. So Zig was using that from the start. And LVM is also the library, the, the, the backend, the powers Clang. Uh, the C compiler. So the idea is Zig needs, so first of all, Zig needs to have a lot of uh, interoperability features with C because it's a systems programming language. And the reality is that you can't forget about C because OSs are written in C or in any case they expose a C ABI, um, dynamic linking, it's it's a C thing-ish. Uh, so in any case, you need to have the, all these bits and pieces figured out in your language if you want to be a low-level uh, low programming language. Um, and then Zig was already bundling LVM, so adding Clang, it's like just a tiny step. I think that LVM is like 40 megabytes or something. Uh, well, no, maybe less. It, 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 in any case, it, it's a chunky piece of, of data. Uh, and adding all of Clang on top of it, it's not that much work. So what Zig does, basically, so Zig is able to compile C and C++, but it does so through Clang, by bundling Clang. Now, it's not just exposing to you a rebranded Clang, it's doing more than that, but the idea is that it's a solid C and C++ compiler because it behaves exactly like Clang, because it, it has the exact Clang code in it that does the building. So what Zig does on top is caching uh, defaults, uh, providing uh, libc stubs, like uh, the libc for the target system. So, for example, one reason why a C compiler out of the box cannot, from like Linux, cannot target Windows is because it doesn't have a copy of the libc that Windows uses, the, the header files. And Zig bundles all of that in. And, but it's not just like a matter of copy pasting those files. There's some work that needs to be done to deduplicate, compress, uh, make sense of things, etc. So that's what Zig basically does on top of Clang to to be its own C compiler. Gotcha. And and so you mentioned how Zig can compile these C and C plus plus projects, but Zig can like a Zig project can also use C and, and C plus plus libraries within it. Is that correct? Yes, a Zig project can link against C static libraries, C dynamic libraries. We, you can also link against C++, but Zig cannot use, for example, C++ types and functions directly because the problem with C++ is that it doesn't have a well-defined ABI. So like if you compile a C library with, like you have a C library compiled to a static library from compiled maybe with like GCC, and then you link it against uh, other code, be it Zig or, or another C code to make an application that you then compile with Clang, that works. But with C++, everything has to be the same compiler, otherwise it doesn't work. And then you have other problems because C++ has a runtime. You ha has like uh, uh, exceptions, and so you have to have something that is able to run exceptions. So in general, C++ is more hostile to interoperability, like in general, uh, than, than C. Gotcha. Gotcha. And this this may be my ignorance here, but like, does the typical Zig project use a lot of C libraries just as part of it, or are they mostly like pure Zig? Or like, what does that sort of look like? Uh, I would say it's a mix. So, for example, my static website generator right now is using Treesitter and the 
CMARC Markdown Parser, um, which I do plan eventually to maybe removing if I decide to beat the, uh, bite the bullet and write my own parsers for Markdown and HTML. Um, but uh, the point is that the choice is very is very easy to make. Like um, the the C dependency, like uh, Triceter, for example, it's one package that I depend on. And I just need to swap it out with a different package uh, with my implementation and everything will work transparently. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So going back, way back to the the sort of three problems of C that we talked about. One was metaprogramming. We talked about comp time. We talked about compilation of C and C++ projects. What's what's the third big area uh, where Zig improves on C? So the third big area, in my opinion, um, in which Zig improves over C is more about the the details of programming when it comes to like safety and let's say the day to day. So for example, um, in C, there's a lot of things that are undefined behavior. And for people who are not familiar with undefined behavior, it's basically when you write something in the code that the spec says that you should not write in the code. And when you do that, then the consequences are generally a program crash, but by like the name undefined behavior means that actually the, the it's undefined how the program will behave at that point. Um, undefined behavior is is a thing that you can't fully remove from Turing complete programming languages that want to give you full access to the hardware. So it, it's a thing that has to be there. Just to give you one example, um, one thing that is considered undefined behavior is accessing memory that you haven't allocated yourself. It's like reading out of bounds. Uh, so you have an array of 10 elements, you try to read the 11th element. That's bad. Um, and that's undefined behavior. But at the same time, the machine can do that. And there are cases where something of this kind is still correct, even though you can't express that even though you haven't expressed that in a safe way in the program. So the, the line between that being correct, something correct to do or not, is not something that is self-containing the program. It's like the result of your program running in a system that behaves in a certain way, etc. Just to give you an example, talking about accessing memory that you haven't allocated yourself. Uh, I think Windows gives you performance counters for the CPU um, as a at an address as a piece of memory that is made available to every program. And that address is not allocated by you. It's given to you by the OS. So on Windows, that's this one special address that you can read into. And that's perfectly fine to do that on, on Windows. Yeah. So uh, in C, it's very easy to trigger undefined behavior, though. C is very... Also, the type system, for example, doesn't have generics. Uh, and so it, it's very... Uh, how can I say, uh, the, the type system is not very strong. So a lot of people oftentimes cast stuff, uh, pointers to numbers, back to pointers, do pointer arithmetic, and do all kinds of unsafe things all over the place that in Zig you can still do, but it's not the preferred way. It's not the natural way. And doing those kinds of things requires you using operators that make it very clear that you're doing something fishy. It's not like just an ad. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, that was one thing I was, as I was sort of reading more about Zig is it looks like it really favors explicitness, explicit over implicit yeah. and, that, and that sort of thing, like making it clear on what's happening on, on, on these sorts of things, even if that's more, you know, it takes longer to write out or whatever, but at least just like being more explicit about what's happening. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that is uh, absolutely correct. So for example, on pointers, you normally don't do arithmetic. Uh, another thing to see, for example, does is uh, when you have an array in C, an array becomes a pointer to a not defined number of items. You have to then have a second variable that is like your a counter that tells you how many items are going to be there after that pointer. And these are two separate values. And if you get it wrong, then you will do a read out of bounds. In Zig, we favor instead slices. A slice is a pointer that also bundles a length. And so every time you talk about pointers in normal Zig code, you always know what the length is and like you don't get it wrong by mistake very often as another example. Uh, there's a long list of things that Zig has improved from that perspective. So, and, and, and also when you do get a 
crash. In Zig, you also get a stack trace. Uh, while in C, oftentimes you get seg fault. Uh, actually, segmentation fault. Like you get like an error message uh, or like a bad status code. It exits, and that's that's all you get. Don't know what happened. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, and and to be fair, to be fair, um, you can get that behavior also from C. You just don't get it out of the box. And um, and there are reasons why you might want to strip from the executable the information necessary to produce error traces. Uh, sorry, stack traces and, and, and similar things. Uh, oh, also errors. In C, errors usually are like integers, like a function returns an integer and the integer tells you if the function succeeded or not. And sometimes you have that like zero is success and then every other number is a failure. Some other times it's the opposite. Some other times it's a Boolean because also C likes to use integers as Booleans. And when it's Booleans, then zero is false. That means failure. And one is true. And that means success. I mean, in, in Zig, instead, we have a dedicated error type. And an error type, you can't ignore errors. And they have dedicated syntax to, to handling errors um, in a better way. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. OK, so I th like over the last, I would say, maybe decade or so, we've seen some innovation in this, this uh, area of like systems languages, right? We have, we have Go, we have Rust, we have Zig. I think Go is a little more clear on maybe when you shouldn't use it, given that it has a garbage collector and things like that. But it, but especially with like Rust and Zig, where do you see people reaching for one or the other? Is it mostly personal preference or are there types of projects that are much better suited for, for Zig or for Rust? Yeah. Um, so I don't think I can give you a full answer about which type of projects are better served by which language. I do think that this might be the case, but I myself am not really a proficient Rust programmer. I've written maybe a hundred lines of Rust, not more than that. Um, so based on that, I cannot comment on project uh, on projects specifically. But what I can tell you is that um, at the very least, I think it's true that there are different types of developers. For example, you have people who like C++ and who can make it work for them. They do, they use all the features that C++ offers and that's how they make software. Um, uh, for example, uh, l let me think of, of a positive example. Um, a positive example of this is, in my opinion, Andreas Kling uh, with Serenity OS and the Ladybird um, browser and they use C++. Well, now they are transitioning to their own language, but it's still, their own language is still influenced by C++, like it compiles to C++. And in their case, they make it work for them and that's great. But if you give C++ to me, I'm not going to be effective with it because I don't like it. I find it overcomplicated. I find it a bit foot gunny. And also, um, I've seen also all kinds of, in my opinion, bad software behavior that I do believe it's caused by people doing what is common, what is idiomatic with the language, but in a way that causes bad behavior. One example, so I gave you a positive example, I'll give you a negative example. Visual Studio Code takes, sorry, no, without code, just Visual Studio. Visual Studio takes forever to load, takes forever to do anything, and then it takes forever to close. And what I think is the reason why it takes forever to close is because it using destructors, like every object in C++ has a constructor, any destructor, well, not every object, but most do, like you, you can define them and people do use those features. And so when you click the X um, on Visual Studio, it starts running those destructors object by object by object by object instead of just exiting, which is like save the files and exit. That's the correct behavior, but that's not how it behaves. And, and ultimately, in my opinion, that's just like the outcome is wrong. That's not how it should, it should work. So on the other hand, you have people instead then who don't use C++ and who instead prefer C. Uh, one example of that is like the Linux kernel, right? The Linux kernel has been C only for a, for a long time. They never wanted to allow C++. Um, and so for this second type of people, in my opinion, Zig can be a better tool than Rust. Because Rust is, it's not C++, but it's another language that has destructors and complexity and complex features and 
all kinds of stuff. Do you think we'll ever see Zig in the Linux kernel? Or are they going to like just stay hard and fast on that ZM? I don't know. Um, they are starting to get Rust into the kernel, although I believe it's only for drivers right now, so it's not uh, the main thing. Uh, still, no, not to downplay the achievement, um, I honestly have no idea. If I have to be honest, what I'm most interested in, in the case of Zig, um, what I'm hoping for is, so first of all, obviously being in the Linux kernel would be amazing, but ultimately it's up to them. Um, in my opinion, what I consider, what I would consider like the, um, the symbol of success of Zig would be getting into complex hardware like uh, digital cameras, for example. Those are embedded devices that have extreme needs in terms of uh, efficiency, performance. They have budgets over everything, available memory, and they have to do hard stuff, hard real-time stuff. And I think that they could definitely use uh, Zig, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Are there any projects you're excited about that are that are written in Zig? Like Tiger Beetle is the big one that comes to mind for me, you know, a financial uh, database um, designed for, you know, speed and correctness, uh, at, at very high levels. Like any other ones you're, you're pretty sure you're excited about? Uh, yeah, there's a couple. So there's, um, uh, these are like community projects that are big. They're not like financially backed by any like venture capital or similar, uh, but they're still pretty big. One is MicroZig. Uh, MicroZig is basically like a, a hardware abstraction layer for, embedded devices written in Zig. So the idea is like you have a microcontroller, like you have a, I don't know, an Arduino, Raspberry Pi, um, just, and you just type in the model and you automatically get types that describe the pin layout correctly, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's one. Um, because I do think that the embedded space really needs, like for example, the embedded space, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, people do use C++, for example, in the embedded space, but, C++, um, C++ for embedded is very different than normal C++. It's C++ that usually doesn't have exceptions turned on, doesn't use destructors. It's a very different language. While that would not be the case with Zig. With Zig, you would be using just normal Zig. You, there's nothing that you turn off. Um, it, because Zig doesn't even assume that you always have a heap available to you, right? right? Even the standard library, when data structures, like basic ones, like an array list or a hash map, they always ask you to provide in an allocator because there is no assumption that you always have a heap. So sometimes you don't have a heap. And so if you want to have an array list, then fine. But then you provide an allocator that takes the memory from the stack, for example. Yeah, I thought that was super interesting. Like how sort of, um, again, just that explicitness of, of just like always requiring an allocator and things like that. That's, uh, yeah, that's pretty interesting. And I know like some of the stuff. Yeah, that helps a lot with portability. Also when it comes to WebAssembly, like WebAssembly in, a, in some ways you can imagine it as a weird embedded device. It's not really, but it has those constraints. Like uh, in, in, in uh, WebAssembly, you have a chunk of memory that's given to you uh, at project uh, when, when the module is loaded. And, um, and that's what you start with. You don't have a real heap. And so for example, in Zig, there is no special stuff being done for WebAssembly. Uh, you just pass in a web a WebAssembly allocator. It was a malocator. Anyway, uh, here's another project: um, Mach Engine. Uh, Mach Engine is think of it as the Godot of Zig, but with a um, well higher focus on performance, in my opinion, than than Godot, uh, and also a lot of focus on uh, cross compilation and portability. So the idea is that you write your game in Mac Engine, and then not only you can target different uh, platforms, which is important for games, but you can also cross compile, which is key uh, in my opinion, because oftentimes, um, like supporting, it, it, it's tough for game makers to support multiple platforms. Um, yeah. Yep. Okay, that's very cool. Um, so I, I saw you had a, just switching gears a bit, I saw you had a post, this was October 22, talking about Zig being self-hosted. First of all, can you just tell me what, what it means that Zig is now self-hosted? So uh, what it means is that originally Zig had what we call the stage one compiler, and the stage one compiler was written in C++. And um, that meant that if you wanted to, I don't know, do any change to Zig, like add a new operator, fix a bug in the compiler, change, change anything, uh, you had to write C++ code. Um, problem is, we are writing 
Sig, kinda also because we don't want to write C++ code. <laughs> yeah, so that 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 w- there always was an interest in writing the Zig compiler in Zig. The problem is, so well, you can do it, and uh, for a while we would, at some point people started writing the Zig compiler in Zig, and that was the stage two compiler. Uh, the problem is, well, okay, you have the Zig compiler written in Zig. But then how do you build it? Because the idea is that you need a Z compiler to build the Z compiler. So how do you get started? And that pulls in the bootstrap problem. So long story short, now we are we are at a stage where we completely discontinued the C compiler. Now there's only the Z compiler, and we have a fancy bootstrap process that involves WebAssembly to make sure that you can go from just having a C compiler to getting up and running with a Zig compiler written in Zig. Wow. Yep. And and one thing I think is interesting, just like looking back on that. So you, you, know, you posted this 15 months ago now. You said, hey, this took two years to get, to build. It, it slowed some momentum. We sort of knew that it would, um, but there's going to be a lot of benefits going forward. So now looking back 15 months, are you like, are you like, hey, yeah, I'm grateful for for having done that. Like, you know, I feel a little momentum growing there. I guess, like, what looking back at that, what are your what are your thoughts on it now? Oh, um, no, the, the no regrets at all. Uh, absolutely worth it. Uh, for me personally, so I'm sure that all core contributors would agree that it's so much nicer to be able to write in Z than in C plus plus. And yeah, you can watch also. There are some talks from Andrew where uh, there's one specifically about data-oriented programming, where he explains how certain optimizations that are currently in the Z compiler, and when I say optimizations, I mean not in terms of like the generated code, but I'm talking about the compiler itself. So making the compile process be faster. A lot of it, or, and or could use less memory, for example. A lot of those optimizations, uh, he said he that he would not feel comfortable even attempting in C++ because they would be huge sources of bugs because you wouldn't be able to express exactly what you want to express and you wouldn't have tools to check, uh, to catch where some when somebody makes a mistake. Like a contributor adds a piece of code that doesn't account for a certain thing and then you get misbehavior in the, instead of a compiler or, or like a nice crash. Yep. yep, absolutely. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. Slightly away from Zig, but I just want to hear a little bit more about how you got to be VP of community at Zig. I think it's kind of interesting. So, uh, again, you're you're working at Redis Labs as a dev advocate. Is that right? And then, so what was this initial module that you were creating for Redis that, um, I mean, what, was it doing something or was it mostly just showing people how to create modules? Or, like, what were you trying to do with a Redis module? Uh, yeah, so... Well, the or, the full origin story of even how I got hired at Redis Labs is because I made I wrote a Redis module uh, uh, that I made available publicly, like I open sourced it, and it was a module that implemented a data structure called Cuckoo Filters. So it's like Bloom filters, but with some twists, and it's like a probabilistic data structure. It's one of those fancy things that 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 you can that makes sense to do with things like Redis. Um, so I implemented that. Somebody at Redis Labs noticed, and they told me to apply to speak at RedisConf. So I did. Uh, I spoke at RedisConf, and one thing led to another, and I got hired in, into the job. Um, from there, yeah, I needed to explain to people how to do more modules, more in like more in general. Also, because I think uh, at that time the modules API was being extended. Uh, and also Redis Labs was pushing out their own uh, custom modules with their own take on data structures, etc. Uh, so I wanted to explain to people. And at the time, the, the choices were like plain C, like Redis. Uh, technically, I guess C++, but I wasn't the right person for that. Uh, then Rust or Zig. And when I discovered Zig, uh, I immediately read the com time, uh, like the description of how com time works. And that clicked for me immediately. And so that really convinced me to try Zig out and prioritize it over Rust, even though Rust at the time was already more uh, further ahead, more popular. So it, 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 like, I guess it would have been the better choice in many ways. But really, I was like, my brain was immediately captured by comp time. So um, I started using it, spoke, uh, started interacting with the community, 
and um, and I started getting more involved with with the language, and I started writing blog posts. I, 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 at the time, I think I wrote like a couple blog posts uh, explaining to people how to use the comp time. At that point, um, the pandemic and uh, happened, and the lockdowns started. And um, if you're a developer advocate, lockdowns are not good. Or more in general, if you're like for marketing, lockdowns uh, at the time were a nightmare because a lot of marketing uh, branches were used to this idea of having in-person events happen all the time, having people on the ground go to events, set up a booth, give a talk, shake hands. And this was not happening anymore. So, um, so all my managers were confused and didn't know how to move forward. And at the same time, um, well, it's not like I knew necessarily how to move forward when it comes to marketing company wise, but I knew that for my personal job, the obvious choice at that point was to start streaming, uh, do live coding, be more present online. Yeah. And then, so then you started doing Zig, Zig Showtime. Is this right? Yeah, exactly. And that's when I started doing Zig Showtime. Okay. So tell me about Zig Showtime. So Zig Showtime was basically just me contacting people to come and give a talk on, on Twitch um, and show the project that they were working on in Zig or explain a systems programming related concept. But the idea was that at the time, uh, too many people were like running these types of events on Zoom. So and it's not a huge difference, but the idea is that they were run on Zoom like an in-person meetup, except everybody's like the web come on. But it's like it's it feels like an extra meeting. What I did instead was uh, think of it as a show. So people open Twitch. They don't share their own webcam because they are the audience and there's a stage, conceptually speaking. And they look at the stage and, uh, for example, the show had an opening sequence with like an animation and music playing. And, and I was acting as the host. And, uh, and those things did make a difference enough that people just wanted to watch it. Um, and one thing led to another, Andrew started the nonprofit foundation, like the Zig Software Foundation. And when he started this, the Zig Foundation, he basically asked me if I wanted to uh, come on and join him. And I accepted. Yeah, that's very cool. And I love it because it's just like, it just shows like there aren't rules, like, rules you know you don't you don't have to like work your way up step by step inside some internal organization to get to the top like you are <laughs> vp of community at the zig software foundation what happened is like you were super interested in this community you started building stuff on it you started yeah. writing on it you started streaming on it and all of a sudden like now you're uh vp of community and it's like just like you know if you get passionate about something just just put it out there and you can like it's it's kind of fun how how far that passion can go um with that sort of thing yeah absolutely it's a, a lot of these paths in life, nobody knows that they even exist, right? You yourself don't know, but like, it's not just that what people point out as one possible path. Oh, that's, that's the exhaustive, exhaustive list of all the things, the all, the all and only things that I can do. No, there's more out there which are unknown and you can stumble upon them if you're, if you're lucky and do try. Yep. What is it like working for, you know, a nonprofit, the Zig Software Foundation, as compared to you know working for an, an enterprise like like Redis Labs, um, I would say that the the two main differences is that uh, the Zig Software Foundation is a tiny organization and it's extremely lean. So, uh, for example, there's a lot of things like we don't have HR, and uh, and I don't mean that in a, necessarily in a, like oh yeah I don't have to deal with HR. I do think that sometimes having people whose job is to create services within the organization for other people it can be good, uh, but we are a tiny reality, so we don't have that. Um, so something to keep in mind. Um, but on the other hand, that also means that we are extremely efficient with our money, and I'm and and, and so I even though this is something to keep in mind. Uh, I, I do think, I do like what we're doing. Um, last year, we spent 92% of our money to pay developers. So the overhead is very minimal. Um, the the other big difference is that, and that comes also from my title, I guess, I have a lot more decisional power when it comes to what I do from the day to day. And that comes, you know, great power comes with great responsibility because at Redis Labs, I would occasionally get certain assignments, things that I had to do uh, that I kind of disagreed with. And, you know, maybe it wasn't right all of the time, but 
at least in a few situations, I would I was definitely being asked to do the wrong thing, in my opinion. Um, while at while at the Zisa Foundation, this doesn't happen anymore. The, the flip side, though, is that now if anybody is wrong, that's me directly, right? Now I'm the bottleneck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very cool. How many? So you said 92% going straight to developers. Are those mostly developers that work, uh, you know, full time for Zig? Is it is it some sort of like contracting situation? What is that? I guess how many people work full time for Zig, and and do you have any any contractors? Yeah, uh, right now right now is four people working full time and a handful of people uh, building um, hours, let, let's say more or less part-time, I would probably, it, it, like it varies uh, month by month, but yeah, something along those lines, we would love to grow more, like to hire more people full-time. The problem is that, uh, we depend mainly on donations. So depending on the amount of donations that we get, that decides how many people we can hire full-time. And, and what do those donations look like? Are they, uh, a lot of sort of small donations from just developers that love Zig? Are, are there a lot of like companies that sponsor ZSF? What does that look like? Uh, it's a mix. It's a mix. Uh, uh, it's also like intentionally a mix because we want uh, we want our income to not be tied to like one giant sponsor that who you know on paper might be technically not in charge of everything. But you know, if there's one actor that owns all the money, then of course they are in charge uh, at least of certain things. So for us, uh, balance is important. And right now, what we are getting, I think it's more or less 60 percent uh donations from individuals uh from through github sponsors and every and others uh, like we're a 501c3 nonprofit foundation so you can find the z software foundation listed on all every almost every charity uh, donor program so we get money from different platforms and then the remaining 40 percent is uh, more or less um coming from companies either who are already investing in Zig. So for example, Tiger Beetle donates to Zig, Ban uh, also donates to Zig, uh, or also companies who don't use Zig, or at least, you know, not as much as Tiger Beetle, uh, but who still are interested in our mission and want to support us. Yep. Oh man, I totally forgot that Bun was written in Zig as oh, well. Yeah. That's like another, like, <laughs> I don't know why I, didn't, I missed that one. Yeah, that's, uh, that's awesome. And like definitely the talk of the the JavaScript ecosystem um, right now. So it's been a good year for, for Zig in that sense. Um, so we're recording this at the end of January. Um, just speaking on fun, uh, sort of funding and things like that, y'all just announced donor bounties. Can you tell us a little bit about donor bounties and how those work for the ZSF? Yeah. So Zig as an open source project is, well, not definitely not unique, but it is particular in the sense that there is a nonprofit foundation behind it. And there's a lot of, projects out there who don't have any financial structure behind them. And at the same time, it's also, there's also a lot of uh, contributor activity. And um, so given the situation in which we are in, uh, we had uh, in the past non, not exactly positive experiences with feature bounties, meaning somebody uh, who, like a, a company, who, who would like for Zig to have a certain feature be developed, and so who was willing to put money to make that happen? The reason why we didn't have a great experience was because if you make a bounty where basically you're offering money for something to be coded with a deadline, uh, there's the problem also that there's like an implicit competition, like multiple people will raise to implement that thing uh, because only the first one is the one who gets the money. So... Um, that is a problem. That was a problem for us because we don't want people to do, uh, you know, duplicated work where only the first one wins. And also you can bet that the first solution is not going to be the most published one, uh, polished one. So there were uh, like uh, quite a few issues with, with that approach. Um, so we originally had this like rejection of this idea of feature bounties. And we said, please just don't do that. We don't like this. Uh, but after thinking about it for a while, we kind of um, said, okay, let's try to tweak this idea, to the, the, the design of a feature bounty so that we can make it work. Because the reality, so our initial take was you shouldn't do feature bounties because if you have money to spend and you want for something to happen, you could just have a contract. Like you start a private contract with somebody 
who is potentially like a, a Z contributor, so who somebody who has already shown that they can, can contribute Z code, and you have this private contract with them where you pay them a certain amount of money to make the thing happen within a, a certain time frame. The problem is that if you do a contract, then like you have proper, like it's more cumbersome for the person offering the money, but it's more fair for the people, for the person doing the work. And it prevents the duplicated effort type of thing. Um, so that was our preferred thing. But we said, okay, maybe people don't want to do this because understandably it's more work. So how could we tweak bounties to make this happen? And what we said, what we ended up with is this idea where it's a feature bounty, but the money doesn't go to the individual completing the work first, but instead it goes to the nonprofit foundation, which then in, eventually will basically end up paying contributors because that's the business that we're in. That, that's what we do. <laughs> uh, but then at this point, there is no com competition. There's only cooperation because the money goes to the cause that hopefully people care about. But it's not like, oh, it's not a zero sum game anymore for uh, participants to the bounty. And so that's what a donor bounty is. Yep, I love it. It aligns the incentives, incentives in, a, in a slightly nicer way, where you're still getting, you know, prioritization of, of certain features that are important to, you know, big time customers that are willing to pay for it, but without um, the racing aspect and the, and the duplicated effort aspect and, and just a little bit more sort of um, streamlined process and, and collaborative process. Yeah, so I think that's that's pretty interesting. Like, great, good luck on that. I hope that, that works. Is that something that you had... Uh, you know, you're announcing it today. Is that something you you sort of develop this with some enterprises behind the scenes, or are you like, hey, you know, here's our idea on how to do this going forward, and you'll see how it works? Uh, so we developed this as a response, not in exactly to an enterprise, but to a individual um, supporter, longtime supporter of the Z Software Foundation, who was interested in doing something like this for a um, feature of Zig. Um, but who, well, who contacted us privately and, and when they did that, that was, a uh, like even, I think just a few weeks before we had the, uh, all the issues with, uh, feature bounties. So they, they, so my point is that they were very polite and asked that in private and, but we didn't know how to make that happen right away. And we had just the bad experience, just had the bad experience while we were evaluating that. So we wanted to basically say, you know what? Like what what you what we were discussing with this individual in private made sense to us, but we wanted to formalize it as something that is just not a feature bounty because otherwise it would have seemed you know maybe uh, a little bit uh, inconsistent to say oh you guys cannot do this but this guy's fine. Yeah, yeah, very cool. I like it. it. It's cool, and I hope that hope that works out for y'all. Yeah. So and by the way, just to conclude the, the answer. Um, the point is, we have an open donor bounty right now. So after announcing, now this individual has uh, offered to pay uh, four thousand dollars to have um, Zig to give Zig the ability to uh, create DAFs devices. Uh, have you ever heard that expression, a DAF device? No, I haven't. Yeah, so no. uh, it's a funny thing. Um, I discovered it also fairly recently. A DAF device is basically uh, using a combination of while loops plus which statements uh, to create something similar to loop unrolling. So loop unrolling is when you have a for loop, but instead of like instead of iterating eight times, you iterate twice, but then you copy paste what you do in the loop body uh, four times, for example. So basically you copy paste some of the for loop so that instead of doing the for loop eight times, you do it or n times, you do it only a fraction of those n times, but each loop you do more work. And the reason why that might make sense is because sometimes that does produce a more efficient code. As, as a very hand-wavy general way of thinking about it, imagine copying uh, byte by byte something from one array to another array versus using um, CMD instructions that copy larger chunks of, tech, uh, of data from one place to another. Uh, sometimes when a loop is expressed in a unrolled fashion, so with the body copy pasted multiple times, the compiler, the optimizer recognizes that pattern more easily and can produce more optimized code. DAFs devices are a, a fancy version of that named after one guy who worked, used to work at uh, LucasArts, uh, who discovered that in C 
at some point in the past. I don't remember the when. Well, cool. Yeah. If, if you're interested, you know, again, um, go, go check out that bounty or any other open bounties that are, that are at the ZSF, ZSF um, there. We're coming up on time, so I want to close with just some common questions that we, we started asking all of our guests. So six questions here, semi-rapid fire, but um, you know, we'll just see how it goes. Uh, if you could master one skill you don't have right now, what would it be? Reading from a teleprompter. It's, ah, yeah, it's very narrow, but um, if you're used to watching good YouTube channels, like I watch Camera Gear Reviews, for example, uh, uh, they are very dense of inform- in information, and they are very polished and very nice and uh, like the communication is very effective and most of it is thanks to a teleprompter but you need to learn how to read it while looking natural interesting so do they have like pretty much their entire script written out um and they're just you know, i think so i like i don't know for sure for every single channel but for example one channel that i like a lot is gerald and he makes amazing year reviews and he does use a teleprompter all the time um cool that's a good one uh, second question, what wastes the most time in your day? Wastes the most time in my day? Software updates. Software updates. Man, when I need to update something, it's always a pain. And I hate auto-update more than anything. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Well, at least it's not, you know, failed C and C++ builds anymore. That, that doesn't waste the time in your day. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. It, it truly is not. It used to be at some point, but now it's not. Yeah, there you go. Good to hear. Uh, okay, if you can invest in one company that's not the company you work for, you know, which is a nonprofit, um, ideally a private company. So, what, what would that? Who would that be? I would probably invest in Tiger Beetle or one of the companies around Tiger Beetle because um, Tiger Beetle exists as a technical solution, at least partially in the water scope of Interledger, which is this idea of having very cheap micro payments and micro not as in like a couple bucks, micro as in fractions of a cent. And I think that would enable a content creator economy that doesn't exist today that I do think should exist. Yeah, I I am bullish on some of the things that they're going to do, whether that's in in gaming or just other types of like very small payments. I think uh, I think they're going to open up some new worlds in in terms of what's what's possible there. Uh, Yep. So I like that one. Uh, what tool or technology couldn't you not live without? Other than Zig? <laughs> other than Zig. I, knew, I was going to say, I was going to say other than Zig, but you got it. Okay. Um, well, given what I do, OBS. OBS has been fantastic. Like, uh, it's probably the most rock solid um, open source project that I've ever, that I ever used. Like, it's not perfect, but man, is it good. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, what person, which person influenced you the most in your career? In my career, maybe uh, Antirez, Salvatore Sanfilippo, the creator of Redis. He had this idea of looking at writing code, not just as pure engineering, but also as a form of, like, let's say, art. Uh, like, he does use the word art. O- of course, art is a very generic term. You need to understand his particular take on the term. But, um, yeah, I, I do think that that's a perspective that we could all use more. Yeah, it's true. And, and Redis is just such a beautiful piece of, of technology and just like so uh, amazing and fascinating. So yeah, Antares, that's a great answer. Um, all right, last question. What is your probability that AI equals doom for the human race? Very low because, well, first of all, we need to get to, uh, uh, to uh, AGI. Uh, I think we're not quite there yet, but... Um, I think we've been in the business, like humanity has been in the business of creating systems that it doesn't fully understand uh, since the dawn of time. And it hasn't killed us yet. It could be AI, the one that finally (laughs) seals the deal, but I don't think it will. I think there are uh, bigger things that that, uh, might doom us all um, more, more quickly than AI. Yep. Yep. I agree. We're, we're pretty adaptable and, um, creative as, as a, as a, as a species. So I, I feel pretty good about it as well. Um, it's, it's been fun sort of watching the debate on that over the last year as this rolls out. Um, Loris has been, this has been great. I loved learning about Zig and just seeing what you're up to. And I think it's so cool, um, what you're doing there. And I think the innovative things you're doing at CSF, uh, if people want to learn more about Zig, about you, I guess like where, where should people look for, for you? So, um, well, you can find me on Twitter slash X. I'm at Crawloris, C-R-O-L-O-R-I-S. Or you can search for my nickname, which is Christoph, 
K-R-I-S-T-O-F-F. Um, and from there, you can find my personal blog. You can find me. Uh, there's the Z Showtime YouTube channel. I live stream on Twitch also. Yeah. I was going to ask that. What's the, what's Where did Christoph come from? Uh, Christoph is my mother's surname. So in Italy, uh, it used to be in the past that you would only inherit your father's surname. Uh, this has ch- was changed like fairly recently, like uh, five years ago, maybe seven, like, um, yeah, not that long ago. Um, so I never was able to use it legally as my surname, but I like it a lot the way it's written. So I just use it as my nickname. Very cool. Well, Loris, thanks for coming on. We'll link, you know, your Twitter, Zig So Time, ZSF, all in the in the show notes. And yeah, for those of you listening, be sure to check out Zig and uh, see where it could be used in your next project. Loris, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much, Alex.